everyone. My name is Brittany Rogers. Uh, I am a hematolo hematology oncologist at the VA and at Shands. Um, I'm going to kind of go through um, where I started, my course up to this point in life. Um, so it will um, hopefully give you guys some guidance. Feel free, like I said, any questions, write them down. I'm an open book. So let's get started. All right, I don't know if anyone loves Moana, but I have a toddler. And as I was reading over all these great questions that came up, it was just about me, me, me. So I could not get this out of my head. Are you just trying to get me to talk about myself? Because if you are, I will gladly do so. And I will try not to go into song. Allison, you have the permission to mute me if I start singing at any point in time. But um, <laughs> just a little light, light humor to start. Um, so tell us about yourself. So uh, my name is Brittany Rogers. I am a Florida native. I grew up in a very small town called Coleman, Florida. It is in Sumter County in the middle of nowhere, but close to everywhere. So this is my little small town, um, 600 people. I am a fifth generation Sumter County resident. I had to ask my aunt that yesterday. Um, and I'm of the first generation in college. So this is just a little bit of background information about me. I mentioned where I'm from because it's a very small, close-knit town where everyone knows everyone, and I had lots of encouragement um, throughout my life um, and interest in what I was doing, and I really think that helps me be where I am today. So I can't talk about where I am now without starting with the people that helped me get there. So um, I grew, when I when I was growing up, my, my father passed away sudden death when I was seven years old. Um, and I grew up with my grandmother, my grandfather, and my mom. I was the only child. Um, so I had a big interest in health, disease, um, from what I observed. You know, I, I had family members with severe Alzheimer's. I watched several family members suffer from the effects of long-term smoking, being COPD, um, lung cancer, uh, mesothelioma from asbestos exposure in the military, um, so complications of late heart failure, behavioral disorders. Um, I, from an early age, un, um, witnessed the power of these things and I wanted to understand them um, because I felt that if I could understand them better, that, that fear component of them um, would hopefully dissipate. That's how I started getting interested. Um, I wanted to understand these things. I wanted to help those people that were close to me who I loved. And as I started going through, um, you know, middle school, high school, getting that exposure to anatomy, understanding how normal biology, the normal function of biology, and nor understanding how those things could go wrong, the pathophysiology of that just really interested me. And I think at the core of all of this was my love for my family, my community, um, seeing the diseases they had and wanting to help them, first of all, understand it, which I feel is, you know, with poor health literacy can be a, a huge, a huge um, task to overcome, and then to try to help them. So I went to Wildwood High School. I'm going to tell how old I am. Oh my gosh, I didn't put this in initially, but I was the class of 2005. Yeah. Um, we um, did not have like AP or, um, oh my gosh, my mind just went blank, but we didn't have um, any, um, or IB, excuse me, any programs at our school. So we had dual enrollment at our community college. So like half the day I went to community college, uh, my junior and senior year, I knew I wanted to do something healthcare related. I wasn't entirely sure of what. Um, I went to uh, undergrad at USF, go Bulls, no, I guess everyone here is, is UF, so what can I say? But I, I had to go there because everyone from my hometown went to UF, so I had to be different. I had to go to USF. Um, so I did that uh, 2005 to 2009 as a biomedical science major. Uh, I did a minor in public health because I came in with dual enrollment courses and I had you know, Florida prepaid and all that stuff I needed to do something with and, and bright futures. So I, I did a minor in public health as well. Um, and I got involved in a pre-med organization. And I, I, I know I don't need to tell you guys the value of that, but as I put this together, I really started thinking about how much my pre-med organization shaped 
where I am today. So that was pre-med AMWA. Uh, it started when I was a freshman. Um, I knew the, the founding uh, member of it. She and I um, worked closely together and she started um, that organization. Um, throughout looking at the things I did, um, you know, I was, I got involved in the leadership of that. It started out being a small organization, but then it, it grew over my four years at USF, I started out as treasurer, I was vice president, my senior year, I was president. Um, and it got me, it met my, it got me to meet my mentor. So I started shadowing through that program. I um, met um, a Dr. Perez at Moffitt, and then I got involved in her lab. And I, I did um, a senior thesis um, there and got to work in the bone marrow transplant department, uh, research lab, focusing on myeloma. So, you know, a lot of where I am today and a lot of the things I'm going to talk about in a little bit that helped me get through um, pre-med stuff, um, the support came from my pre-med organization. So no plugs or anything. It just, it's purely organic how it came to my mind, but um, I'm glad to see you all are plugged in. So after that, when I finished undergrad, um, I really had a lot of self-doubt in myself. I was scared to death of the MCAT. Um, I just said, why would anyone accept me to medical school? I'm not special, you know, it, these classes are hard. So I was scared to apply and I did not apply. I said, I need to have more under my belt. I need to be a better candidate. I don't think I'll get in. Um, and I think looking back, that was not an advisor recommendation, but I think it was just, you know, we doubt ourselves. Um, no one in my family ever went to college. And, and um, why should I go to medical school? Um, so I did a master. I had um, some funding to do that. And I said, let me just finish up some things I was working on in undergrad. I'm going to do a master. So I did an anatomy master, a year master, actually at uh, the USF College of Medicine. Uh, and then I applied to medical school. And I got in at multiple places. Who'd have thought? I don't know. Um, I, I almost went to USF, um, but I went, ended up going to UCF. I was the second class, not the 100% full tuition and living expense class. Gosh, if I had maybe applied the year before, but I was a second class. I got some, some scholarship um, and then I went to, to UCF. Um, so after I went to um, medical school, I knew I wanted to stay in Florida. So I interviewed at residency programs um, throughout the state and some out of state as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about why I chose internal medicine later, but I did um, internal medicine residency here at UF uh, from 2014 to 2017. And then after that, I did my fellowship here. Um, I rotated a lot with the, the hematology oncology program when I was a resident and everything I saw was good. And this was the bar I held all the other fellowship programs against and I decided to stay here, um, which is a trend that that continued and now I have a job here and we'll talk more about that as well. Um, so that's all the CV things. Those are the dates. That's what I did. Um, I was busy. You guys know what school looks like. Lots of studying, lots of classes, lots of tests, lots of stress. Um, but how did I get through it? So I looked at like, you know, what do you do with your dashes? We all know the education part, but this has to be a balance of life. Um, and that's what really fills you, you know, part of that, yes, we're all scientists, we need that, but there's often something else, and whether, whether that be family, whether that be, um, you know, other interests, whether that be your friends, whether that be sports, and as I started looking back for me, sports had really been an important part to get me through. While I did all this in high school, my gosh, what was I doing? I was doing like every sport in high school. I loved it. It kept me sane. Um, where, you know, I go to school and go out and run around for a while and do all these different sports and then go home and study. That was my outlet. I talked to you guys about undergrad, you know, looking back at this pre-med organization I was in, it was great. You know, we went, we went and cooked dinner for cancer patients once a month and we all hung out and it was a great, um, at the Hope Lodge in Tampa, it was a great experience. We had an intramural soccer team, um, and we, we played together. We were terrible. Uh, I think we were probably the last in the league, but we had fun. Um, and then we played flag football as well. These were these were the intramurals from my pre-med group and it was great. 
Um, and then I think back about, you know, my master program and then medical school, I did intramurals then too, softball. And then we did floor hockey, which if you've never played, it's fun. I mean, it's so aggressive. Uh, we did that when I was in medical school. We were the beta blockers, um, <laughs> very, very medical nerdy terms. Um, and we were the atrial kicks for my, our soccer teams. But um, <laughs> so that to me, I think about it, that was a great outlet. And and I'll talk about a little bit more, you know, now I'm attending and I'm married and I have this toddler and, you know, I don't get to do these things, you know, I, I, I don't get to find these outlets. So now I have to kind of be creative because I can't just like go, you know, join a kickball team. I don't know. Um, but that to me is what helped me balance. So it's just kind of being really um, retrospective on yourself, looking and then seeing what you really need to, to be balanced. And to me, I need some kind of like athletic, typically team sport out, um, out um, outlet, um, which was, this was pretty enlightening to me when I looked back at what really got me through. Um, so, and then, yeah, what happened during my residency and my fellowship? Well, I got married and then I graduated medical school like five days later. So that was two big changes right away. I, I, I changed my last name and I added an MD in like five days. That was, it was really big. Um, and then during my fellowship, I had my daughter, Sophie, who's about to turn two next month. And that was, you know, medical and all this is hard, but oh my goodness, that is, that is a different kind of hard, <laughs> very rewarding, but, um, but challenging. And, um, luckily I'm, I have a very good, you know, my fellowship program, um, is there's a lot of great female leadership and they made that very comfortable of a transition. And I got a lot of support. I remember, um, We'll talk about this a little more, but I remember, unfortunately, in my pre-med group, we had some some shadowing um, and some speakers come to us. And I remember we had a physician with twins who came and spoke to us, and she just said, "You can't do it. You can't do both. Um, it's either one or the other." And I think she probably had a bad day that day. But I remember we all walked away from the um, just everyone just sat there after she left and was like, was that the most depressing thing you've ever heard? It's like, we can either be doctors or have children. Um, so I just want to take this moment to correct what I heard when I was a pre-med that um, you can do everything you want to do. Maybe not simultaneously. Is it gonna be challenging? Yes, but can you do it and be sane um, and have children that you know turn out to be you know pretty normal members of society? Yes, you can, okay. So what do I do now? Um, so I graduated my fellowship in uh, June. We had a virtual Zoom graduation. And then I started in the end of July, my new job. So I am an assistant professor of HEMOC um, at the VA. I focus on thoracic, which is lung cancer. Didn't I tell you I had all those patients or family members with lung cancer? I guess that just stuck with me. Um, so I, those are my favorites. Um, and then I also do a lot of head and neck cancer. I also had, you know, family members with that and they just have a special place in my heart. Um, I work at the VA. I have a clinic here um, two days a week. And then I also uh, staff or supervise the fellow clinics um, who are, are in training hematology oncology doctors. I, I um, watch them and help, help them develop their plans and take care of patients. Um, and then I also do some benign hematology uh, at UF. Okay, so um, how did I choose my specialty? So um, I loved internal medicine um, in medical school. Internal medicine is really like the adult doctor, it's like the adult version of a pediatrician, basically. So, um, you know, you have family medicine, they do adults and children and a little bit of OBGYN. Um, but then you have internal medicine doctors. These, like I said, are the adult doctors. Um, and then it, most of the specialties in adult medicine, like cardiology, um, GI doctors, hemonc doctors like me, um, rheumatologists, most of these patients, uh, most of these doctors had to do internal medicine first, three years of training. So I thought I probably wanted to specialize and um, I just loved internal medicine. I loved the fact that if an adult came to me with a question, no matter what it was, apart from like, you know, psychiatry or 
can I cut this out or not? I'm not really sure about that. Um, I could answer it. Like, what is this medicine? What am I taking? What is my problem? You know, diabetes, hypertension, um, COPD, cancer, like most of the adult problems, you can come to me and I'll have a pretty good answer of what to do. Um, so I liked that. I, I didn't want to be put in a box of like, oh no, that's not my specialty. If it's not this little teeny thing, I have no idea. So I liked that internal medicine training. Um, and cancer, like I said, is, has always intrigued me. Um, and from a biology standpoint, I thought it was very interesting. I have to understand how things work normally to understand how cancer is so advanced and go what could go wrong um, to lead to the growth of cancer. So I have to have a good understanding of normal biology to understand the abnormal biology. So I liked that from like a pure you know, science standpoint. Um, and then as I shadowed and watched more oncologists at work, I realized, I realized that the oncology patient relationship is really special. So while I'm like highly trained and very specialized, you know, I, I do my little corner of the world, um, I really become my patient's primary care doctor, um, especially while they're getting treatment. If my patients are getting chemotherapy or radiation, you know, sometimes I'm seeing these patients as often as every week. Um, every three weeks, every month, every six weeks, depending on what treatment they're on. So they see me way more than they see their primary care doctor who they might see every six months. So I really, you know, handle most of their thing, most of their issues. Um, and I meet patients sometimes on the worst day of their life. Um, so that's a, that's a heavy thing to do. Um, and it's an honor to do. Um, I've had patients, you know, I've been doing oncology now for this, my fourth year, counting my fellowship. Um, I've had patients for, for years. I never forget that first meeting on some of these patients and, you know, just the, the fear and the anxiety and the confusion of what's going on and what do we need to do. And the fact that I can meet with these patients in an hour and at the end, they, they generally feel better. They understand what's going on. They know they have a plan. They know I'm on their team. Um, and it's just such an honor. It's just, that's such a, you know, a vulnerable place for patients to be in. It's frightening. And to know that I'm there and I make it better um, is fulfilling. And that's what you have to have in your job. You have to have a, a source of fulfillment. And, and that gives me mine. Um, and it's, you know, it's beautiful to help them navigate these decisions and take in, you know, to account what's important to them, um, you know, and, and make the right decision for them, not just what the textbook answer is. What do we, how do we treat these patients? You know, I remember, I'll just give an example now. Um, I remember when I was a first year fellow, I had a gentleman with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, which is an aggressive type of lymphoma. And um, he tried first line chemotherapy, which we treat with aggressive chemotherapy. And I repeated a scan on him. And after a couple of cycles, his cancer didn't listen at all. It got bigger. It went somewhere else. Oh no, he's progressed. And I remember just feeling a heat, you know, a heat wave when I looked at that scan. Oh no, how am I going to tell him this? Um, you know, he's tried so hard. He's given up so much for this treatment and um, he's done everything right. And that's the thing, like these patients, they do everything right. But, you know, cancer's rude sometimes and it just, it doesn't listen to us. So I remember when I met with him and I showed him the scans and we talked it over and he said, doc, I'm okay with this. And, and, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about my patients. They're veterans and my, my, my veterans have a unique perspective on life. He said, I should have died in Vietnam years ago. I made it out. Every day since then has been a gift. And I knew it wouldn't last forever. Um, he just said, I just want to make sure that you're okay. And that just took me back. He was worried about how I would react. He wanted me to be okay. I mean, it just, just, I was speechless at that point. Um, so, you know, my patients have a very interesting view on life and death. They dealt with their mortality, you know, sometimes for years. Um, so just remember that, you know, it, he knew what he wanted. He was comfortable with it. And um, you just get, you know, these close relationships with patients and sometimes they surprise you. You know, I know my patients well, I see them often. 
I know their wives. I know their kids. I know their grandkids. They show me the pictures. Oh my gosh. Get the phone, pull them up. Let's show her. You know, they saw me when I was pregnant. They, they know, you know, um, we share stories, we share pictures. So I get very close with my patients um, and everyone has to find their balance. Do you let patients in or do you not? Um, for me, I'm pretty open. So I do, they know my daughter, they know she's about to turn two. Um, it's just, it's just, that's, that's how I am. And, um, and it's worked out for me. Um, so what is my lifestyle like? Uh, how do I balance work, family? This is what I call myself. I am the chaos coordinator. Um, chaos tends to follow me uh, even before I had children or not super busy. But um, this, is, this is kind of what I do. Um, so my lifestyle, I would say is busy. And like I said, you can do it all, just not always at the same time or with much sleep, but things tend to always work out. So I have a, my, I mentioned my husband, he's a Publix manager. So he works long hours. He's very busy, um, but he helps a lot above and beyond. My toddler daughter is in daycare. Um, so she's actually at a UF daycare. So she's pretty close to me and she has a great experience and she loves it. Um, I have a house cleaner, which is the best money I've ever spent um, with the amount of time that I have. Um, I just don't feel fulfilled. Some people want to, I get no fulfillment out of cleaning my house. So uh, yeah, I'd much rather give that a hundred dollars to somebody else and let them do it. Um, so that's been great. And then working at the VA um, helps me have a good work, uh, work life balance. Um, and I'll, I'll talk to you about what I love about my, about my job. Um, but it really helps me um, balance things. Uh, oh, I just saw the chat. Okay. Sorry guys. Um, Oh, thank you guys. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll go into those questions and we'll talk about all that. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, I've got a good work-life balance here. Um, I can still be involved, actively involved in patient care. Um, and I have, I have the best patients. Um, if you've ever, I hope you guys get experience to work in the VA, but my patients are just so grateful. They're just so unassuming, you know, as not as a general person as a rule, but you know, 99% pretty, like they're not demanding. They're just so grateful, great patients. And I could specialize in my preferred area of oncology. I could be a specialist in what I wanted to be a specialist in. And I get to teach fellows. I love, I love, you know, working. I work with medical students. I work with residents. I work very closely with the fellows. So this was like the best place for me to do all of those things. Um, so this is what my day looks like. Um, I, I tried to outline it. Um, this is a typical day. Um, so uh, a day in the life. I get up at 5.30. Um, I don't always get out of bed at that time, but I try to. The alarm goes off at 5.30. Um, I get ready. I get my daughter ready, pack her lunch, get her. We get out the door. We try to get out the door at 7. And then we come to Gainesville. And my tour at the VA is what we call it. That's my typical hours. The VA is I'm salaried, but we still have like traditional hours. We're supposed to be visible and present. And those are my visible and present hours, um, hence the military time. Um, so I have a tour and I'll tell you guys what actually happens during my tour. Um, I pick my daughter up around, she gets out at 4.30. These are COVID hours. You wanna talk about things COVID have changed? Daycare. <laughs> so it used to be, I'll just go into it in a brief moment. It used to be six to six thirty to six, but now because of COVID it's 7.30 to 4.30, which is really hard, but we make it work. Um, so I pick her up or someone picks her up at 4.30. We go home and then it's like a mad dash of spending time, eating dinner, getting a bath, getting a bedtime story, going to bed. No, go to bed. You have to go to bed right now, night, night, right now. Um, and then I try to go to bed by 10 because I'm one of those people who really need eight hours. Um, that's never going to change. I don't know how these five hour people do it, um, but I need, my, I need my sleep. <laughs> okay. Um, and then this is typically what my weeks look like. Um, this is pretty good. Like I see, I know what a lot of my colleagues do um, who are in private practice or other places. You see, there's a lot of big blanks of time there. Um, that allows me to have the ability to do other things. So um, on Monday mornings, I staff the fellow clinic. So we have five second year fellows. They see their patients. 
um, they come and talk to me about it, what the patient's diagnosis is, how the scans look, what we're doing for them, what should we do? They come up with plans and I kind of supervise. Um, if they don't know what to do, we figure it out together. I kind of double check what, what the plans are. Um, I don't see their patients. They see their patients on their own. Um, they're, you know, doctors um, and they're the primary, really the primary oncologist. I'm just supervising. Tuesday and Thursday afternoons, I have my own VA patient, my own VA clinic where I see my own patients. Um, I have, um, I kept my patients from fellowship who are any kind of cancer or benign or hematology problem. And then now all my new patients are patients who have lung cancer, head and neck cancer. Um, and then um, Wednesdays, I have a VVC clinic, which is a video clinic. That's one of the things that COVID has changed. Um, we are now doing more telephone and virtual appointments. The VA was previously very strict about like refilling oral pill chemos and things like that on patients without seeing them. But unfortunately, because of COVID, we, or fortunately, I guess you'd say, we've been able to, um, to loosen those restrictions. So I do some, I have a video appointment, like I have a patient at one o'clock today, I'll see on the video chat. Um, and then on Friday mornings, I do the first year fellow clinic, which is exactly like Monday, but just with our brand new Hemont fellows. Um, and then I participate in what's called tumor board. I do two tumor boards a week. I do the head and neck tumor board on Wednesday mornings and then the thoracic tumor board, which is really great. That's a meeting with like um, the, the uh, surgeons, um, the radiologists, pathologists, radiation oncology. Basically, we all get together, you know, the way medicine should be in one room or one Zoom chat. Um, and we discuss a patient, we look at their imaging, and we all together make a plan. So right away, I know if the surgeon says, yes, this patient should go to surgery, or radiation says, you know what, I don't think we can radiate them. It's just everyone in one room making a decision together, um, which is really great. Um, and it's, it's, it's a good thing. And I, I love being in part of those. And you can see at the bottom, these are other ways I fill my time. So I cover um, the VA hospital 12 weeks a year. Um, with the fellows doing any new hematology oncology consults that come in. So the fellows will go and see the patients and typically I just staff or hear about them. I'll see the new patients and we come up with a good plan. Um, and then I cover um, some weekends here at the VA as well for the, the HEMOC. Um, those are typically just by phone. I rarely get called. We don't get a lot of consults uh, at the VA on the weekends. So I just kind of staff and we make plans I haven't, knock on wood, never had to come in yet on the weekends. Um, and then I do do a few weekends of the year at Shands doing benign hematology. So, you know, sickle cell, thalassemia, this person's bleeding, this person's clotting. What do we do? I do some of those. I typically don't get called after hours. Um, it just, the VA doesn't work that way. I'm not really on call in that way. I can get called on my Shands weekends, but important to know that I'm not getting called all night long as a fellow sometimes, but not as an attending, which is good. Um, what do I like and most uh, dislike most about my job? So I like, my, my patients are heroes, like 100%. So that's, that's kind of awesome. Um, I get a lot of time to spend with patients. If you go to private practice or see docs out in the community, you might see 15 minute time slots. Um, that's really hard. Uh, especially if patients are complicated um, or, you know, I have to send them to um, like other extenders, you know, like the, they're going to see the nurse practitioner, the PA, but they never get to see Dr. Rogers. That's not really how it is here. I get an hour for new patients and I get 30 minutes for return patients, which is, is great. I, I don't have to rush. I can do a good job and my patients really appreciate that. I get to treat patients regardless of their insurance status. You know, sometimes in the community, a patient comes, they don't have insurance, they don't qualify for certain programs. I'm sorry, we just can't give you that medicine. Um, here, if it's really FDA approved and um, it's something that, that's, you know, reasonable, I can give it to my patients and it doesn't matter if they can pay for it. We cover it, um, which is a great feeling. Um, federal holidays, that's also good. <laughs> I don't have to work on federal holidays, so I'll take that. Um, and I get a lot of credit, like, um, you know, um, when the people sit down and they add, they, they look at all I do and they add it up to make sure it equals, you know, basically a full-time job. I get a lot of credit for what I working with medical students, residents, and fellows, which is, is fun. They keep me sharp. Um, they know all the newest things. We have great discussions. So I love working with, um, learners and I get credit for it, which is great. What I don't like, I think this is everywhere, but documentation, you know, just sitting, typing, all the notes, 
telephone note, uh, you know, it's a, we have to do it. It's important legally. Absolutely. I, I like reading my notes later, but I don't like, and I don't love sitting down for a couple hours writing notes. Um, but I've gotten much faster with this now. Um, and it's a necessary evil. So I guess I will just accept it. Um, so this is what typical compensation looks like for someone in my career. And do I feel it's fair and adequate? So I looked this up. Um, the average uh, hemonc physician in the United States makes somewhere in the upper 200,000s to, I mean, if you're in private practice and you're just booming it out, I guess, um, close to 400,000. Um, so this is patients, this is doctors who've been, you know, practicing for one year versus doctors who've been practicing for their entire lives. Um, so I'm first, I'm fresh out of uh, fellowship. So this was my VA contract. Um, so this is what I make. I had a little bit of a signing bonus with a two, two year agreement. I think it's fair and adequate. You see all that free time I have. I get off at four o'clock every day and I don't most weekends. I'm not getting called. I don't have to be here. So um, you can't really put a price tag on a quality of life for me. Some people are like, I want to make as much as I can. I want to have a good life, be able to have a car and a house and support my daughter. As long as I can do those things and have a job I love, that's what I want. I, I'm not trying to be a, be a millionaire. You know, I just want us to be comfortable and happy. Um, so how can my career change? So Hemonk is fast changing. Um, and I'm speaking mainly from, for both, but mainly from oncology. I get um, something called the ASCO Evening Post, and it basically sums up what's happened recently in oncology. Almost every day, there's either a new trial result, a new drug approval, the FDA has approved this, oh, now we can use this and that. So, I mean, um, it's the rate that the, the information is um, being accumulated is, out, is, is rapid. That's why I think about people who are like in community oncology and kind of, you know, many years out of fellowship, I, I, it's hard to keep up. That's why I love being involved in the academic medicine where I'm involved with fellows and learners because we're talking about this. You know, it's, it's on the forefront of our mind um, and it helps me keep up better. We have more technologies for detection, better imaging. So, you know, you really have to stay up to date because um, it changes very fast. And then as we develop more targeted therapies and we understand, you know, how cancer is, each cancer is unique, we're going to change what we do. You know, in the past, we were like, oh, okay, you have a cancer in your breast, so we're going to give you this chemotherapy. Um, but I mean, now it, it's so different. What what specific targets do you have in your cancer? What makes it unique? Do I have a drug that targets that abnormal protein? Um, so we're focusing more on each personalized medicine, treating each cancer um, differently. So I expect that shift will happen over time. And I think people are just going to get more specialized. Um, it's going to be, I think, more challenging to be a general oncologist and see a lymphoma, and then I see a leukemia, and then I see a head and neck, and then I see a bladder cancer, and then I see a cervical cancer. Oh my goodness, like that's a lot of data to keep up with. Um, so I think it's going to just be more challenging to be a general oncologist. And I think there's going to be, everyone's going to have their tumor type. Um, and I hope we're going to see fewer smoking related cancers. There's a decline currently uh, in lung cancer, and uh, I hope that happens. And then I think we're going to also see fewer HPV-associated cancers. I'm seeing a lot. 70% of new head and neck cancers are not related to smoking and drinking. They are related to HPV. That's the importance of the Gardasil vaccine, both in males and females. Um, so I hope as we eradicate HPV and the the I hope we're going to see a decrease both in cervical cancer and in head and neck cancer. Um, I'm seeing 50 year olds with head and neck cancer from HPV. It's just really sad. Um, what should people consider in my profession before going into it? Like I said, prepare to be a lifelong learner. You can't be like, well, when I was back in medical school, we talked about this uh, lung cancer and <laughs> no, 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 you know, uh, it, 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 it changes, it's rapid. By the time you go three years, probably a lot of what you learned, it's gonna be obsolete. So you've gotta be on the edge of your seat. Um, it's rewarding. It's an honor to treat patients with cancer, but there's going to be an emotional burden to it. And that the depth of that is going to vary from person to person, how em empathic you are, you know, can you be, um, I think there's going to be a fine line between being 
um, between having empathy versus kind of being able to re remove yourself from the situation. So every person has to answer that for themselves and find a good balance. And there's a diverse job market. Like I look at my former, my co-fellows who have graduated in the past, you know, three or four years, patients can go, I mean, you can go into academic medicine, private practice. Um, someone that just left here recently is doing hospital oncology where they're in like a private practice, but they only see their pa patients for the practice while they're in the hospital. So, I mean, he's like on a week off a week, which is kind of like what some hospital docs do. So that's interesting. I have another former fellow. She's at the FDA now. She approves all these breast cancer drugs that are um, up for approval. She reviews them all. And, and so that's really nice. She specializes kind of in that, in that kind of form or being involved in research. So there's a lot that you could do. Um, and then how do you cope with uh, or prevent burnout? So I do a lot of different things. Spending time with my daughter and my husband, that's my daily like, you know, relaxation, calm down. I have two little dogs that I love to go on walks with. Uh, we used to travel. I used to do Zumba. I loved it right before, before COVID and now I, I haven't. Um, but I like to cook and bake. I like to read. I read, I've been reading for pleasure lately um, after I finished my boards. Um, and then I have good friends. And I think good friends and family and, and it's that all of these things together have helped me kind of uh, get through it. So let's see, I know there were some questions. See, I keep losing the chat. Okay, here we go. Okay, uh, I'm just going to kind of scroll up and uh, kind of go through some things if that works for you guys. Okay, so we talked about, um, Eric, uh, how it might change in the future. Um, COVID has changed and affected, you know, when a lot of clinics stopped um, seeing patients, oncology didn't stop. Uh, cancer does not wait for COVID, unfortunately. Um, so we were working at 100% through all of this. Our patients um, continue to get chemo and continue to get treated. Um, they can't wait. You know, I'm worried that some patients, you know, getting like surveillance scans and things like that. I worry um, and patients not getting mammograms. I just worry if we're going to get some later cancers um, that could have been picked up early at later stages, unfortunately, um, in the next year or so. But, you know, we made some safe changes um, for our patients, like in our infusion room, typically, you know, that's where patients who get chemo, they sit in, um, they sit in recliners and they get their IVs and there's like 19 of them in a room and previously their family could come in, everybody's eating and talking. And so now it's just like, just the veterans, they're spread out. Um, so that's changed a lot. And we're doing more telephone and video. Um, so is internal medicine the only residency you can do and then do a hematology fellowship? So uh, if you wanted to do adult, then typically yes. Um, now I think, and I, I could be wrong, I think family medicine may be able to, but I'm not entirely sure about that. But typically it's internal medicine. Like everyone I know of is, that did, it, did internal medicine, unless of course you wanna do pediatric chemoc. Um, then you would do pediatrics first. Um, but I'm 95% sure you, the internal medicine is the only way. Um, what would you have specialized in if you continue? So yeah, so I did my internal medicine for three years um, and it was just pretty, um, pretty, I guess, general at that point. Um, internal medicine in itself, some people specialize, like I know someone who does, they're not, they, don't, they didn't do endocrinology, but they're kind of like an internal medicine diabetes specialist. But most of the patients, uh, most of the people that do internal medicine just tend to be general and have their own patients and do kind of all of the primary care for their, their patient. Um, what advice would I give to people interested in an MD PhD program? Well, I'm not as up on this and how would you apply? Um, Ooh, I'm not a good answer to that. I'm, I'm sorry. I know that um, one of my co-fellows uh, did that, um, but there might be someone better to answer that than me. Um, oh, thank you guys. Yes, you can balance it all. You can do it. Um, yeah, so thank you ask, for asking, Lindsay, about the maternal leave for my fellowship. So um, I kind of did something crazy. Um, I did a year's worth of call. Uh, so I had my daughter in the end of November. I did a year's worth of call from July to October. So while I was like six 
seven, eight months pregnant, I just went ahead and did my whole year's worth of call. So like every other weekend I was working, I did my night phone calls. So then once I had my daughter, I didn't have anything to do from November until July, meaning like after hours of work. Um, I didn't have any nights and, and things like that. I thought that was good. It was a little crazy, but I did, I had a, my pregnancy was uncomplicated and I had no problem with it. So I just dug my heels in and did it. And then, um, so that was really nice. Um, I used all my vacation time and my sick leave to take my um, maternity leave. I was the last fellow to do, do that because after that, the ACGME come out, came out with a rule that, uh, that females, uh, that parents, I guess, can take um, six weeks without having to extend their fellowship or under or their residencies and without having to use all of their um, vacation time. So now that is different. I was literally like the last person to go through and who did that. Now you can take those six weeks and still have your vacation time. Um, so that was hard. Um, I mean, it, it was doable. And, um, but you know, from, from when I had my daughter until, so from like the end of November until July, I didn't have any vacation time because I used it all for my maternity leave. Um, I'm glad the ACGME made that change. My program helped me and they, they put me on really light rotations when I came back. So I wasn't here all day. Um, and my, my husband had to actually, he took a leave from work for a few weeks. So my daughter would be a little bit older before she started daycare. But I think they've been, there's been a lot of positive changes that have happened now. Um, um, and you know, when is the best time to have, I don't think there's ever a good time. Never, it's never going to be perfect because now it's like, you know, yeah, I have more finances, but, um, but I have to be here like all these long hours. Like I'm like clocking in kind of things. Um, as a, in a fellowship, you know, you kind of have to do the things that you're doing. And then when you're done, a lot of times people aren't watching whether you're here or there. If you get your things done that you need to do for the day, a lot of times, you know, on certain rotations, you can just go home. I can never just go home. Like I'm like a, now. Um, and the good thing about fellowship is there's lots of built, built in backup and the programs are able to cover for you. So I think, you know, I, I think it's, there's, I would not discourage someone from having a child in their training programs in residency or fellowship where they are set up to support you. You can definitely do it. It might just require a little bit of pre-planning like what I did. I'm like, I'm going to go ahead and do all my calls before I have her. So I don't want to be on, I don't want to have her crying and the phone ringing. So I just took care of all that, but it might require some, um, some planning, but you guys are smart people. You can totally deal with it. Um, so at the VA, we have all specialties here. We have psychiatry, we have, um, we have surgery, we have all of the internal medicine specialties, GI, cardiology, rheumatology, you know, internal medicine. The only things we don't have is OBGYN. <laughs> we send people to Shands, it's probably for the best. Um, and that's, that's mainly OB. We do have GYN, but not OB. No babies are being born at the VA. <laughs> uh, and we don't have pediatrics here. Um, but we do have GYN. Um, so basically almost everything. We have like vascular surgery, we have neurosurgery. Um, it's, it's great. Um, yeah, so it's mentally, staying mentally healthy, um, it's, it can be a challenge. Um, I think it's just kind of finding that balance and just, I just have to reflect, you know, like I said before, um, you know, athletics were always my outlet. I find that going outside, going on a walk, yeah, I can't, you know, do the team sports I used to, but going outside and playing with my daughter and kicking the ball around, it, it like releases those same endorphins for me. So I, I try to do that. Um, so the mortality rate, that's, that's a good question. Um, you know, I do a lot of, I did a lot of um, inpatient oncology, like at Shands, we have a ward eight East. We see a lot of the patients who are getting inpatient chemo, which tend to be pretty aggressive cancers um, that have to do that. So, you know, in the hospital setting, I saw a lot of death as a, as a resident and, and a lot of the leukemic patients. And that was hard to, um, to kind of wrap my head around. But when I worked more in the clinics, in the clinics, you see those success stories. Like I have a lot of patients who are in remission that I see every six months, we get a scan, they're doing fine. Okay, I'll see you in six months. And um, I have a lot of patients I follow for a long time. Have I had patients that have passed away? I have, but the way I kind of think about it is, you know, they've been given this diagnosis, they're on this trajectory. 
I can either make that better or I can make it worse. And there's lots of ways that you can make patients worse. There's lots of ways that other people can make patients worse. So to me, kind of being that advocate, understanding what my patient wants, understanding what their quality of life is going to be like from these decisions, um, even if I know they're probably going to die, they're going to die of this, well, I'm not going to cure them, trying to make things better. Um, and you have an amazing ability to do that. Sometimes that making it better is to say, you're too sick. This is too far gone. We shouldn't do anything. We should do hospice. You know, sometimes that's the right answer and protecting instead of being like, you know what, let me give you this really big, bad, hard treatment that's, that's going to ruin your quality of life and maybe speed things up. Um, these are difficult decisions, but I think just knowing the, the weight of these decisions and how you're going to help people, um, is, is important. Uh, do I find myself doing a ton of additional reading outside of the VA? Um, not really. I do most of my reading while I'm here. And the good thing is like with the fellow clinic, when I'm staffing, they're coming to talk to me about their patients. In a day, I, I, I've heard the case of, gosh, maybe 30 different patients. So any questions that come up, I'm kind of reading. That's keeping me plugged in. And we have a lot of, you know, lectures for our fellows as well. So I, I still go into, I zoom into all of those and they're listening and I'm still listening too because things change. Um, so I, there's lots of ways without it being over burdensome in my personal time um, um, to do that. Uh, and I think I talked about the COVID-19. Um, yeah, oh yes. Um, oh, I don't wanna butcher your name. Kachuka, I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I butchered it. But yes, that's a great question about a spouse in, um, in medicine, yeah. Um, yeah, so my husband is like, he's a saint to start with, but, you know, I remember in residency when I was just working a lot and here all the time, it was so nice to go home and talk to someone who had different stresses at, at their work and a different outlook on life. Cause I, by the time I went home, I was so sick of talking about medicine and, you know, cause we, sometimes when you're an intern, you've been here at six o'clock, you're going home, it's like seven o'clock and you're just like, I don't want to, you know, I don't know how compassionate I would have been to hear about like how his intern day went, you know, <laughs> some people can definitely do that. I don't know. I'm just a little drained. Um, but you know, my husband's a Publix manager. So like crazy things happen at his work and he tells me about it. And it's like, he's, he's so understanding of what happens to me. He listens. Sometimes I know he doesn't know what I'm talking about, but he's just like, uh-huh. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's nice to have, um, I like it. I, I like having a partner who's not in medicine personally, but um, he's so understanding. And, you know, sometimes I work weekends and he's like, you know what, I'm just going to take that weekend off. So I'll be home with our, our daughter. You don't have to worry about it. I'm just going to take the weekend off and we'll hang out. And he just makes things easy for me. Um, residency. So it wasn't too terrible. Um, intern year is rough, but um, it wasn't too awful. You can definitely do it. Um, and every residency is different. Um, so, um, being in sports and medical school, medical students, uh, to be involved in miscellaneous curricular, extracurricular activities, I would say as you kind of go through it, your involvement in other things has become less and less because you have less time. You know, I remember being at your guys' stage and thinking I have no time. Uh, no, you have lots of time. You just don't realize it right now. Uh, you'll realize it in 10 years, but your schedule is just wide open. <laughs> Um, but you have to just find something. But um, for me in medical school, I had to do something else. And it was a lot of fun to do that with my um, co-fellows or co-medical um, students, excuse me. Um, I'm really good at compartmentalizing my emotions, I think. Like I said, I had a lot of like traumatic things happen as a child um, and through growing up. So I think I've dealt with some pretty big things and I can just I don't know, I can just get through it. It just doesn't affect me. And I think maybe that's a good thing that I'm in the line that I'm in, but I can keep going. Um, so I do mainly oncology. I do do some, some hematology on the weekends. Um, as a fellow, I did everything, but I, I picked oncology because I like, like that better. Um, the characteristics I value in the residents, I mean, just engagement. You, we can tell when, you, when you're engaged and when you really care or not. Um, you know, I think that's the, the biggest thing is just being art genuine um, and being engaged in what you're in, you know, and being flexible. You know, you guys know it's, these things are, it's, there's, there's so many restrictions, especially because of COVID right now. I think just being flexible, being, and being genuine is the best you guys can do. Um, about research, I'm not currently, but we're in the process of opening some trials here at the VA. Since I just got started, I just took my boards last week. I've been trying to deal with all that first, but I'm going to be involved in more research here. 
Um, yeah, and then you have to do an oncology fellowship after internal medicine residency. Um, and then a HEMONC fellowship, um, so it is, it can be competitive. Most of our like residents here at UF um, match. I mean, if you do a good job in residence, I think for each each next step, you just have to do a good job at what you're in. Like who makes who makes a good fellow? The patient who is the person who is a good resident. Who makes a good resident? Typically, the person who is a good medical student. I mean, you just have to try to excel at each level you're at, and that's a good predictor. Um, like I said, I I was rotating all the time through the fellowship program here when I was a resident. They knew me. They knew Brittany Rogers. I remember them saying like, if we don't take you, there's gonna be a lot of people who are mad. Like, you know, we we, we just have to take you. It's <laughs> <was> like, okay. <laughs> but um, I think just, you know, you just have to um, show your interest. And even if that, if you don't wanna go someplace internally, you wanna go somewhere else, then show it to the people who are gonna write your letters. I read a lot of letters and really um, when patient, when, when somebody really likes you, their letters are different. You can see just like a, you know, this, he was a great, he came to clinic, he was there, you know, as opposed to someone who really backs you up. Um, you just put yourself in those positions and be, um, and be known. Um, you can get residencies in other states, absolutely. Um, but I think it's easier to kind of, one in the hand is worth two in the bush, is what I say. If somebody knows you, if they know you at your medical school, you've done your, uh, your third year clerkships, they've seen you, you know, that's easier, but you can definitely go um, to other places as well. Um, oh, the MCAT, I don't have any tips. It's, it's just, you'd get through it. So much of it is not gonna apply to the rest of your life. I don't think about physics at all. You just, it's one of those things you gotta check off the box. It does not define you as a person. Just do what you gotta do, get a good score, and then you'll be an awesome professional at whatever you do. Um, I wish they'd get rid of it. I don't know if I could say that, but I think it's annoying. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, yeah, Joe, I wish I would have had my daughter earlier. I think about that sometimes when I'm tired. I'm like, man, if I was like 21 right now, I could be like doing it, running around and doing all this stuff. But it was the perfect time. It was the right time for my family, uh, for my husband and I to do it. But um, I, I think it, it all works out. There's never a perfect time, but, um, but that. Um, yeah, it's hard to keep friends from medical school. I think you just have to make the time. Um, just be there for each other. You know, I, I just had one of my best medical school friends. Two of them have recently went through health problems. One was just unfortunately diagnosed with breast cancer um, after a pregnancy. Um, so, you know, it's just being there for them. You know, we, you know how much you need support. Your friends are too. They're not always going to ask for it, but you just got to make that time and call them, you know, um, and ask them how they're doing. That's the most important things. Um, and then surgical oncology, um, you would do surgery and then do uh, a special, a fellowship in surgical oncology. Um, let me see. Any advice for typically first generation college students? Um, yeah, so first generation college students, that's a good question. Get a mentor. Um, I am someone to kind of guide you. I remember I was kind of figuring things out. I didn't know what to do. Um, you just have to have a mentor or someone to guide you. You guys have a good organization, it sounds like. I do um, some mentoring through a program here for uh, UF for first generational um, college students or minorities. It's, it's, oh my gosh, it's slipping my mind right now, but just find a mentor. Um, Madison, email me. I'm happy to, if you have any questions, um, my email's included and I'm happy to give you some recs. Um, getting a master, you don't absolutely don't have to. You, you definitely don't have to, um, Kayla. Uh, it was just kind of something I did. You can go straight in. That may would likely make more sense for you. Um, so, and then, um, so I don't do a lot of procedures. I do do some bone marrow biopsies as a fellow. I did, you know, bedside bone marrow biopsies. Not a lot of procedures. Mainly, um, I see patients and then I talk to them about treatments and either prescribe chemo, um, um, and then just age appropriate cancer screenings, whether that's colonoscopies, if patients have been long term smokers, they need screening CTs of the chest, pap smears, mammograms, those are all important. Um, I definitely grew up in a community with less access to health care. I have thought about going back, but then the villages happened. I don't know if you guys have heard of the, about the villages, <laughs> but that has basically blown up in the area that I grew up in. So now they have lots of access to health care. Um, so it's a little bit different. Um, uh, I, you know, I 
think I'm glad I got a master. Thank you for asking that. Um, I didn't really share that, but during my master, my grandmother who I grew up with passed away. And I think if I would have been a first year medical student during that time, it would have been really rough for me. Um, but, um, but thank you uh, for asking that. Um, so, but just for personal reasons, I'm kind of did the good, done that. I know, uh, Renee, I, I, I wanted, I've been trying to get pre-meds in um, to, to work with me. Yes, the minority health professional. Yes, thank you, thank you, that's it. Um, I've been trying to get undergrads here, but I think it's, um, that's what's, um, it's because of, I think COVID and everything along those lines. Um, unfortunately, we haven't been able to get, I've been trying to get my mentee here to see me, um, to work with me, but um, let me see, I saw, yeah, the Minority Health Professional Mentorship Program, yes, that's a, that's the good one, I'm a mentor to that. Um, did I miss any other big, sorry, I kind of scrolled through, um, I know that's the challenging part for you guys right now with the volunteering, how do you shadow, how do you volunteer, I know COVID has, make it, has made it challenging, um, I don't know good answers to that, but, um, but, um, yeah, just keep trying. I, I hope things will get better. Yes, I have a, my email, I think is on, um, you have it, Allison, and I think I put it on the first, let me go back to my. Yeah, we have a Facebook group for this, so I could post your email on the Facebook group for people who want to come. Sure, you. yeah, and it's on this too. Um, it's just my name, Brittany.Rogers at medicine.ufl.edu. Um, Oh, and what happened to the villages? Um, just there's there's now hospitals there. There's a lot of uh, more access to medical care. Um, previously, we would have to either go to Ocala or Leesburg, and it was really like there was a lot of disparities, a lot of um, lack of access to hospital, things like that. Um, so there's definitely more access currently. Um, I thought about going back there actually, but I wanted more of like an academic kind of setting. So this is the best place for me for now. <laughs> Oh, thank you guys. It was a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, feel free to email me if you guys have any questions. Um, I wish you all the best. Yeah, thank you for speaking today. There is one more question that popped up in between all the thank uh -oh. yous. I don't know if you wanna answer that or not. <laughs> you guys are fast, let's see. Um, I can read it to you if you can't find it. Please. Yeah, it says, you mentioned that you value your sleep. What was it like for you as an undergrad and as a medical student in your studies? Oh, thank you. Um, just, I just always made the time. Like, um, I would just try to get everything I could done in the daytime. And I just knew at a certain point of the time, at least for me, after like 10 p.m., I'm not going to be productive. Like, it's just not worth my time. So I would just really focus and make myself um get things done earlier in the day. Even sometimes that meant leaving where I was, going to the library, you know, not leaving until I was done, things like that. I just have to know myself. And I know it's it's gonna be more Facebook or whatever um, and then it will be uh, actually getting things done, so. <laughs> All right, thank you for speaking today. I'll post your email um, in the Facebook group for people who might've missed it on this slide. Yeah. But for anyone who wants it, take a picture of this slide now so you have her email. Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks for speaking.